Welcome back to the Diamond K Show here on RadioOnFire.com. Baltimore is a city in crisis, turmoil, and uncertainty. 2019 was the second deadliest year on record. With a city with just over 600,000 people, we ended last year with 348 homicides. Violent crimes like carjackings, armed robbery are on the rise. Baltimore's opioid-related deaths from September 2018 to June 2019 were 449. That is 42% of the state's total. Repeated police misconduct and various scandals within City Hall have weakened the public trust and confidence. Amid this political turmoil, Baltimore will elect its next mayor. After this break, very quick break, I will be joined in studio by one of the leading mayoral candidates, Mr. Thru Vignaraja, today on the Diamond K Show. Welcome back to the Diamond K Show. Joining us today for the interview, he's been a litigation partner, a deputy attorney general for the state of Maryland, a chief major investigations uh, for the state's attorney's office, assistant U.S. attorney, business analyst, law clerk for Justice Breyer on the Supreme Court, and a president of Harvard Law Review, Mr. Thru Vignaraja. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, let's dive right in. Uh, after the challenges facing Baltimore City, why in the world would you want this job? You know, look, everybody knows the city is in crisis, but we also know what this city could be. Uh, we have so many great things happening here. We have this uh, rich history. We have this diverse population. We have people that are fighting in all of our communities every day to make this city a better place. They know, they believe that the best days of Baltimore are ahead. Um, its leaders need to lead the way to make it happen. Um, this may very well be the hardest job in America, but I don't know that there's a job I want more. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's a tough job, like you said. And um, I think that we can agree that accountability of our elected officials is something that's high on the list of voters. Yeah. Um, how exactly would a Thiru Vignaraja administration show transparency to the citizens? You know, one of the first things we did when we announced was we said we would, by example, usher in an unprecedented era of transparency and accountability. On April 10th, we announced our campaign. On April 15th, I filed my taxes. On April 16th, I released five years of tax returns to the public. We were the first mayoral campaign in Baltimore history to do that. And we said, we're doing this not just because you ought to know where our sources of income are and who's buttering our bread. Uh, make sure that there's no concerns with how we filed our taxes over the past five years. This, of course, is in the wake of a mayor, a police commissioner that had exactly these uh, problems. It was also to signal that we're going to do things differently. We're going to set a different tone and a different example from the very, very top. We called for a requirement that all city leaders of that stature share their tax returns with the public. Because right now, and you said it in your introduction, trust in government is at an all-time low. Yeah. Uh, and whether it was deserved or not before, in the last couple of – how many other cities have had two mayors, two police commissioners indicted and convicted of crimes? How many other cities have had a state aide here, a state senator there uh, convicted of crimes? How many other cities have had the GTTF – police corruption scandal, probably the worst in American history, Definitely. unfold in the last couple of years. If you're going to try to rebuild trust against that backdrop, you've got to do something fundamentally different from what everyone has been doing. But that, of course, was the start of what we said. That symbolic uh, announcement, that honest sharing of our tax returns, was the beginning of what we thought was needed to cure this concern. We've also pledged that we would do a independent audit of every city agency top to bottom so we know how the money is being spent and how it's being misspent. We haven't done something like that comprehensively across the city since the early 80s. Yeah. Um, 
And so that, too, I think, interferes with people's ability to trust government. Nobody knows where the money is being spent. Um, and then the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to put in place safeguards so there are early warning systems for the abuses uh, that have plagued and defined too many of these agencies. You know, the, the GTTF officers, they collected over a million dollars in overtime, over a million dollars in overtime during the course of their conspiracy. And I, I always say, before you learn how to forge a st statement of probable cause, before you learn how to plant a gun, you get comfortable committing overtime fraud. It's the easy thing. And those eight officers, they weren't collecting $2,000, $3,000 of overtime. They were collecting all of a sudden ten, twenty, thirty, forty, sixty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 of overtime in a single year. It was staring at us in our face, and we did nothing about it. So what have we pledged to do? We pledge that every police officer who collects more than $10,000 of overtime in a given year is going to be subject to an automatic audit. There may be very good reasons why you're collecting that much time in overtime, and we're just going to ask you to confirm it. But we want to make sure that there is a culture supported by policies that say the kind of abuses and fraud of the past will not be tolerated, not on my watch. That's good. That's good. Uh, in November, you talked about ending the bloodshed, and you released your plan to cut murders in Baltimore in half. Can you expand on that a bit? Yeah. You know, um, when I was a prosecutor in Baltimore City, we had murders below 200. It's down to 196. And we were doing it not by arresting everybody on every corner. We were doing it with fewer and fewer arrests. Over the preceding few years, you saw the number of arrests coming down. You saw the number of young black men incarcerated for petty offenses coming down. And you saw murders and shootings and carjackings and armed robberies on the decline. We were building a durable, sustainable strategy that was not only making the city more safe, it was making the city more just. Um, what we have pledged to do is to bring murders down dramatically and rapidly without mass incarceration, without zero tolerance, without cash bail, without mandatory minimums, but instead relying on the strategies that other cities have used, that we have used during that phase, and expanding upon them. We actually laid out 20 specific things that Baltimore has never done that I'm pledging to do on day one. And the reason we framed it that way is because, you know, honestly, so many candidates say the same things. Uh, we all agree we have to focus on violent repeat offenders. We all agree we have to focus on gangs and gun violence. We all agree we have to invest in our schools and have to create jobs and opportunities. We all agree about that. There's yeah. consensus on that. But what are the next 150 words? What are the next 1,500 words of how you get from those sound bites and aspirations to actually getting the job done? And in our 26-page comprehensive crime plan, we lay out one strategy after another that provides the level of detail that should inspire confidence in the citizens and voters of Baltimore. It's not just wiretaps. It's 12 simultaneous wiretaps in the deadliest neighborhoods in Baltimore. It's not just prosecuting burglaries. It's clearing the burglary crime scene backlog and going after uh, uh, killers using burglary cases. It's not just uh, cameras in the CCTV, uh, you know, on the corners or, or ring cameras on the houses. It's a $100 rebate for commercial and residential property owners that get these cameras and register them with the police department. It's not just recruiting more police. It's a college cadet program that we can use to get a more local, more diverse, more professional police force. Those kinds of details are absent in everybody else's plans. They are the centerpiece of ours. What is, uh, and I know it's not a one solution thing, but the biggest problem facing Baltimore City schools, you think that it is the accountability piece? Like what, what, what's going on there? You know, if you were trying to boil it down to one problem, I think it is this culture of low expectations that we have allowed to persist and define the school system in Baltimore. You know, my mom and dad uh, are retired city school teachers. My yeah. mom taught at Poly. She finished her career many years later at Morgan State. My father taught at Edmondson and Douglas and Southern and Western. And so many of the challenges that we see in our school system today, they've been there before. But that means people have been watching 
and witnessing a national tragedy unfold in our school that system is true. and have done nothing about it. Um, when we think about what we have to do in the schools, it's not incremental stuff. It's fundamental stuff. We have pledged uh, early on in the campaign to guarantee universal pre-K for every three- and four-year-old in every corner of Baltimore City, free. We've guaranteed that every graduate of a Baltimore City public high school will have free access to college, whether it's a community college or a trade school, a public or a private university, anywhere in the state of Maryland, if you want to go and you graduate from a city public high school, whether it's Dunbar or Douglas or City or Poly, we will make sure that you have no debt when you start or end that process. Where would funding come from for that? You know, it turns out um, uh, it's not that expensive, but I want to take a step back before I explain how we, we pay for that. When we see priorities like uh, a bigger police department, nobody says, where's the money going to come from? We find the money. They're, we budgeted $12 million for overtime a couple years ago. We spent $50 million in overtime. The next year, we budgeted $20 million in overtime. We spent $50 million in overtime. Nobody said, where did the $35 million come from when we had to pay the overtime bill? When the cyber attack happened and we dished out tens of millions of dollars to patch up what something that could have been avoided, nobody said, where did the money come from? It came from the parks and the recs and parks That's budget. True. Um, but nobody was asking those questions. But for some reason, when it comes to universal pre-K or free college, all of a sudden, everybody is focused on uh, the bill. Well, it's a fair question, and I want to answer it. But I just want to note that that question doesn't get asked in the context of things that don't involve our children. Military, too. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, but my job is not to just point out that philosophical problem. It's actually to make sure I answer your question, too. Uh, it turns out, as I mentioned before, it's not that expensive. Uh, community colleges are already free. Hmm. Trade schools are incredibly inexpensive. They are very, very inexpensive. Our public universities have uh, some of the best in-state tuition for Maryland residents in the country. Even if you graduate from College Park, the most expensive one, after four years, your average student debt is $27,000 and change. That means we're talking about $7,000 a year per person uh, uh, at, to go to College Park. And our private institutions, Loyola, Goucher, Johns Hopkins, they give a huge amount of need-based aid, and so many of these kids have need. Um, there were 12 students that went from local public high schools to Hopkins, and virtually every single one of them got a full ride. So let's take that $7,000 number. That's actually one of the largest numbers for College Park. Let's round it up to $10,000, okay? $10,000 yeah. per person per year. Well, here's the real tragedy. Uh, we only graduate 4,000 kids from our Baltimore City public high schools, and only 1,000 of them right now even start higher education. So... 1,000 students times $10,000, it's $10 million. Even if it doubled, it's $20 million. Yeah, because if the opportunity is there, then more potentially could. I, I be sure a, hope so. Yeah, I sure yeah. hope we have that problem. And even if that problem doubled, that problem doubled, uh, we'd be talking about $20 million a year, half the police overtime budget, to tell the world that Baltimore is the first city in America that guarantees every graduate of Baltimore City Public High School free college education at any place in the state of Maryland. That would be a triumphant uh, uh, victory for our city and for our kids. That would be groundbreaking. Um, that, that would be. Uh, let, let me ask you this. You, you mentioned the cyber attack. Yeah. And um, for people that are, that are watching that may not know what we're talking about, um, last year... Uh, our city's infrastructure was attacked. Uh, some hackers demanded 76 k for that. Uh, how would you have handled that? Would you have paid the ransom? What, what, what would you have done? Yeah. You know, um, I don't think this is as hard a question as people make it out to be. Um, Baltimore City was the only city in America that was successfully struck by cyber attacks twice in one year. We literally got hit a year before our 911 system did, and we apparently did nothing to address the vulnerabilities. And then the second time we got hit, uh, we had a new mayor, and Jack Young thought that the way you're supposed to approach this is the way that we approach Iranian terrorists. It's not. Uh, <laughs> this is part of the cost of doing business. You ask any uh, corporation that gets hit by a cyber attack, they are expected to pay a small amount of money. They pay it 
uh, at lunchtime and they're back up in line by dinner. Um, we instead didn't consult any experts. We didn't talk with the institutions that have expertise here in Baltimore and Maryland. You know, U.S. Cyber Command is at Fort Meade. We have world-class facilities at Johns Hopkins, at the University of Maryland. We have all of these resources in our midst. We have some of the best cybersecurity firms in the country here in Baltimore, and we didn't ask a single one of them what to do. What you do is you pay the ransom and you make sure it never happens again. Instead of paying what it would have been, you know, less than $100,000, the bill is now already at $15 million and counting. Right. Um, what a terrifically stupid solution we crafted to a simple problem. Is Jack Young qualified? Look, I think Jack is a person of good faith. Uh, I think he has been a public servant uh, for a long time in this city. Uh, but nobody ever looked to Jack to get us out of this crisis when he was council president. He was council president. And people looked to other people for solutions. I don't know why we would think he'd be better prepared or the person we would turn to now that he's mayor. Uh, this is an incredibly difficult job. And Jack is a person of good faith, but I don't think he's the leader that's going to lead us out of this crisis. Okay. Uh, how would you rate the job that um, Police Commissioner Michael Harrison has done uh, since he's been sworn in almost a year ago? That's a hard question because if you use the barometer that I will evaluate myself, which is, is crime going down? He is not succeeding. Yeah. Crime is not going down. Uh, it's going right, up. It's going up. That's exactly right. Uh, the problem is that Commissioner Harrison is, I think, a, a quarterback without a team. He's got no offensive line. He doesn't have any receivers he can throw to. There's no offensive coach to give him a playbook for what to do. He's come into a different city than New Orleans and has been charged by the mayor with coming up with and executing a plan in the most violent city in America, and he's got no support. Um, if you evaluate Commissioner Harrison from the perspective of identifying some of the deficits in the institution – and trying to pay some attention to fixing them, I think he's doing pretty well. I've seen him talk about the need for information technology improvements. Our police department, our homicide detectives, still use Lotus Notes. My, my interns don't even know what Lotus <coughs> Notes is, and yet that's how our homicide detectives try to clear and solve uh, this overwhelming avalanche of murders every year. Mm. Um, he seems to have appreciated the need to train better sergeants and middle management. He seems to appreciate the importance of making sure the consent decree process goes forward seamlessly. Um, in that respect, he's impressed me. I think he has the gravitas. I think he has the record. I think he has the common sense that's needed to run this police department. I think that's one of the reasons they hired him. That's yeah. right. Uh, but I don't think he is succeeding with respect to the crime plan. But he's not supposed to do that alone. He's supposed to do that in concert, in collaboration, in partnership with a mayor and a city hall that has fundamentally failed him. Yes. Um, it, it sounds like you would be willing to keep him on if you were elected. I would. I would. That's good. I've, I've been very public about the fact that continuity of leadership is important um, and changing out the commissioner, the head of this agency, so you can blame them for the failures is what bad leaders do. And that has happened. Do. That has exactly. happened. Yeah. You know, we, 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 it is rarely the fault of the police commissioner that crime goes up or down. But we tend to pretend that that's the person to blame so you can fire them and say you're going to do something different and then pretend like you're doing something different when, in fact, nothing is changing and you're recycling and repackaging the same failed policies that got us here in the first place. Yeah, I mean it's that's that's tricky because it's if a football team is not successful, Dallas Cowboys, they have the pieces, but is it the coach? Is it the quarterback? Is it Jerry Jones? It's probably Jerry Jones, but you know, I mean, who who gets the blame? Yeah, you know, you know, it's it's great about analogies is that sometimes the analogy is just simpler. In the context of football, there's a lot of different people that are responsible for making that succeed. Right. In the context of government, the buck stops with the mayor. 
And one of the things that I think distinguishes our campaign from the approach that so many of these career politicians have taken is they tend to point fingers, deflect blame, abdicate responsibility, point to others for why things are going wrong. If crime doesn't go down when I'm mayor, blame me. If the schools don't improve when I'm mayor, blame me. If our economy is not creating more jobs for returning citizens from prison and for PhD students at Hopkins, blame me. I think it is so frustrating to watch leaders covet the job and then get there and pretend it's not their job. Uh, that is the opposite of the kind of leadership that I think the people of Baltimore want. I've interviewed a lot of people. I have not heard anybody say that before. Yeah. I, I appreciate you pointing that out because yeah. uh, I know I'm saying it on tape and I hope people do hold me accountable and hold my feet to the fire and, and measure me by the marks that I have set I will, I will hit. You know, when I said we're going to get murders below 200, that was not some, oh, things are going to improve, the cities are, the, the streets are going to get safer. It was a very specific mark so that you can measure your leadership against those goals. What are your thoughts on the surveillance plane? It's been uh, controversial to some. Yeah. What are your thoughts on it? Um, you know, it's, a, it's an important question. It implicates public safety. It implicates privacy. It implicates community concerns. It's one of the reasons why I think it's important that that be a decision that the mayor make. That's not something you delegate to your police commissioner or to somebody that can be fired. I think it's a decision the mayor's got to make. Um, before I was a candidate, back in October of 2018, um, I wrote a piece in the Baltimore Sun. Um, I was a candidate. Mayor Pugh had not yet you know, started the implosion. Um, and I wrote a piece in the Baltimore Sun that said, look, the way Baltimore City pursued aerial surveillance a few years ago was indefensible and unconstitutional. Without public hearings, without public input, without public awareness, nobody should be able to defend that. That was, that was terrible. Um, but here is a way of doing it with some limits and restrictions that would be respectful of privacy, that would be effective for law enforcement, and would be defensible in court. Um, and I outlined my advocacy for aerial surveillance with those conditions. You use it to investigate certain kinds of investigations, homicides, shootings, carjackings. Each time you want to use it, police officers have to get a warrant to make sure that a judge is signing off each and every time and it's not being subject to abuse or misuse. Um, after a certain period of time, after every three months, after six months, you list all the occasions where you've used it and you indicate whether publicly. you solved publicly, public audit, and you indicate whether or not you solved that particular murder or not. Because that's the only way we can assess whether the fiscal concerns, the privacy concerns are worth it. Um, I have called for a public oversight uh, board composed of members of the community to make sure that we're doing it right. Um, but we can't just say, because it was done so indefensibly and so terribly last time, that we're never going to look at it again. This is a potent tool, in my judgment, based on my time as a prosecutor, that could help law enforcement, that could help prosecutors uh, significantly in solving and prosecuting murders, shootings, and carjackings. Um, I do think it could be a valuable tool. And I'll tell you one, one quick story. I prosecuted uh, a pair of carjackers when I was a city prosecutor. And uh, some of the most potent evidence that we used at trial was video from Captain Roy Taylor's traffic helicopter. Uh, the perpetrators had started the carjacking around rush hour, and there was a traffic helicopter over. And Captain Roy Taylor literally called out uh, the scene as the carjacked car uh, crisscrossed the city for you know, 20 minutes. And at the very end of the chase, uh, Captain Roy Taylor had tracked it all along, and you could see it literally on the TV screen. You could watch the, the, the car racing around Baltimore. At the very end, it went out of sight of the helicopter. You didn't see the very end. And the two perpetrators jumped out of the car, one from the passenger seat, one from the driver's seat, even as the car lurched forward. And it just so happened that just as we lost sight from the traffic helicopter, there was a, a ground camera that saw them up close. 
and you literally saw one of them stumble immediately because it's actually hard to jump out of a moving car. The other one actually spun around and got, you know, 100 yards away before he was apprehended. But the combination of the ground camera footage and the helicopter footage was what the jury needed to see, the before, the middle, and the after of that crime to get the in conviction. order to be uh, uh, confident that they could deliver a conviction. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. That, um, uh, and that's almost a perfect perfect scenario but scenarios like that i mean i've always said that if you can just solve one then it would be worth it to me um so i I like this quote of yours and it it says that crime and corruption have persisted too long enough is enough together we can build a baltimore we can believe in how long would that take you know this this story is is ripe to be told Uh, And it has to be told quickly because the narrative of Baltimore, this perception that we are the most violent city in America, it can be extinguished as quickly as it was started. Uh, After nine months in office, I intend to be able to go to the local and national press and say, look, for five years, you have written headlines about how we are the deadliest, most dangerous, most lethal city in America. That was fair and accurate reporting back then, but it isn't true today and you owe us one. Write a story about how we're the first city in America to legalize marijuana without federal or state approval, that we're taking that money and funding universal pre-K, free college, growing the endowments of HBCUs, taking care of the maintenance and repairs at these local schools. Write a story about how we're the first city in America to have a dramatic reduction in violent crime without mass incarceration or mandatory minimums, because that story We need you to tell the world that Baltimore is different than it was even a year ago. And once that story catches hold, we get to tell it over and over and over again. I don't think the greatest turnaround story in America is going to take a long time to start. It will take a long time to finish. And I intend all of us to come together to work over the course of a generation to build a city that we can believe in. Um, But the start of that story, chapter one, starts on day one. That's excellent. Uh, Mr. Vignaraja, thank you for your time today. Thank you so much Um, for having me. Absolutely. How can people support your campaign? Through2020.com. That's T-H-I-R-U. 2020.com is our website. You can sign up. You can send me an email, through for Baltimore. Spell it out. T-H-I-R-U-F-O-R, Baltimore at gmail.com. I still answer my own emails. And I want to hear from folks in the community. Uh, We're having coffee conversations all across the city. Every corner of Baltimore, we care about. We have to lead together. So I want to hear from citizens all across the city. Thank you so much for the time. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Baltimore, the primary election for Maryland is April the 28th, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Early voting for this election, Thursday, April 16th through April the 23rd, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. You've listened to the Don McKay Show here on Radio on Fire. See you guys next time.